Um, so I'll uh, start with an agenda. So we're going to cover uh, a little bit about us. Uh, we'll cover the problem that we saw. Um, and then we'll establish some basics for our solution to that problem, some of the reports you can get out of it, and then uh, hopefully you feel like you can do this too. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm the leader of the customer success team at uh, Gigamon Insight. We were uh, formerly Iceberg. Uh, you don't know that. We're a network security monitoring platform, and we just got acquired in July. Um, I'm really big into process and data. Uh, I feel like that's the common thing over my career is the ability to understand a problem, break it apart into pieces, uh, explain it back to the person who told me the problem, um, develop a, an objective hypothesis about that, uh, and then see if they agree, and then um, uh, provide them a solution. Uh, if, if you kind of notice, I've done that here. I know that I'm between you and beer right now because we're right about four. I've given you a little progress bar. Uh, just to give you an example of that. Um, I, I'm in, I was a former Air Force um, linguist. Uh, I, I have an MBA, which I found out yesterday is kind of a four-letter word here. Uh, and then I got some security certs, too. You're up. Disclaimer here, this, um, first, this is not a talk on how to or why you should conduct threat hunting. Um, we, we, smarter people have done that already before. Um, what we're doing here is talking about the process on capturing and reporting and measuring the value of your threat hunting operations. Um, it was kind of a pain point that we observed in a lot of our customers and partner environments. Okay, um, so if I'm going to be able to live with myself for the next 40 
25 minutes or so and let Justin um, do what he does, I want to give you a little bit of threat hunting content. Um, so what I'm going to start with is there's no defined industry standard right now for what threat hunting is. It kind of means different things to different people. Uh, some people will refer to it as Some people will refer to threat hunting as retrospective detection, or kind of like the, the manually the, uh, going through, uh, hunting for data, trying to, to manually search things and answer questions. Threat hunting is human directed, so it's different than you know, your classic like uh, alert uh, driven detection stuff. Like there there's, has to be human interaction involved to both pose questions, answer questions, and pivot. Oops. Um, so like I just said, it begins with a question. Um, hopefully it's an interesting question because I find that's typically more fun to, to hunt for something that's interesting to answer, but it doesn't have to be interesting either. Um, then another key thing, like I said, is being able to pivot or be able to go down deeper and deeper into um, to additional rabbit holes as, as you're looking for data on a network. And finally, um, for general threat hunting context, key thing to me is that it, just this idea of iteration. Threat hunting, it's a very much a, a rinse and repeat kind of a process. Um, it's never really done. Um, it, it's never truly finished. It's something that you're, you're going to ask a question, try and answer it, leads to more questions, rinse and repeat. So what I'll say here is, even though there's no standard definition, um, this is what our favorite definition is. And this comes from the folks at Squirrel. It's important uh, in terms of level setting, so I'm going to read this verbatim. Threat hunting is the human-driven, proactive, and iterative search through networks, endpoints, or data sets in order to detect malicious, suspicious, or risky activities that have evaded detection by existing automated tools. So uh, let's get into the problem that we saw. Uh, I'm curious, who has a threat hunting program right now? How many people are thinking of introducing a threat hunting program? I'm very curious if you've th seen this. So um, we found that there was tons of great content on hunting, right? Um, everything from why you should uh, conduct th threat hunting. I think this is probably covered the most. Uh, there's a bunch of examples on how, right? Um, uh, everything from the specifics on how you should form a hypothesis and the process there. Um, uh, you can download, there's a bunch of examples on GitHub of, of previous hypotheses that um, people have developed. There's even data quality measurements that people will suggest how you should measure those. And then there's webinars, right? Every, every vendor's like practical threat hunting and, and, and X tool. Uh, and those, and while I joke at them, uh, they are useful, right? Uh, they give you an idea. Uh, maybe you don't use that tool, but um, you can kind of extrapolate it and, and apply it to your program. Um, so you can start getting this idea, right? We could do this. So the excitement builds. Uh, we've got our best people on this. I've got a tool set. I've got logs. I can start doing this. Uh, I read this thing on a hypothesis. Uh, I went to a class um, for four days. And you know, I, I focused really hard on hypothesis. Let, let's do this. Let's find evil. So we're going hunting. And uh, we're getting excited about it. Um, and uh, you know, th this was a lot of our, our customers were really excited about this. And kind of heard this in the industry. Um, and then the questions start building, right? Um, how are you going to measure success? Uh, it was funny because we'd asked that question and, and people kind of pulled back. Um, does your management understand what your goals are? And do they agree? When you talk about metrics, um, how are you actually going to collect those? Like, is somebody going to put that into Excel? Who, specifically? Is that your hunt hunter that's doing that while he does it? Um, who's your long-term manager of this? Uh, how are you going to make sure that this kind of achieves the outcomes that you've, you've set out. Um, yeah, whatever, right? We're, you, you know where this is going, right? We're hunting evil. Let's do this. Um, so uh, this is typical hunting program. Um, and like all hunting programs, uh, we catch them. We're done. Those with hunting programs, how many times does this happen, right? This is immediately, every time. Yeah, no. You don't find evil. You find stupid. <laughs> You find all this stuff, right? And, and, and let, me, let me make sure I'm clear that there is value here. We, we know that this is valuable, right? Um, you remember our previous definition. 
uh, it's not just about malicious or evil. It's about suspicious and risky, right? And these are all those things. And yeah, okay, you'll, you'll find some evil here or there. Um, if you haven't found evil, though, um, this is what happens, right? Uh, your management's like, okay, well, w what are you doing, right? Um, we get things like, did you catch them yet? Uh, our lead analyst is, is dedicated to this. What are they doing? Um, since they don't seem busy, can you have them do this? And we saw this a lot, actually. This was pretty uh, depressing. Um, lead tier three seasoned uh, practitioners would be tasked with, uh, well, can you have them approve non-approved software installs? And it's because they, they, nobody was um, proactively reporting on the, the outcomes that they were discovering. Um, and so is this really adding value is a question that they were asking. So can you blame them? When I say them, I mean management. Um, maybe. Uh, I'll, I'll say that my team, um, when, when we start out projects, uh, most of the time, hopefully, uh, we set out a set of objectives that we can communicate up, right? I have a manager. I gotta establish what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and then kind of report on how we're doing that. Um, hopefully your managers are doing that too, or at least you're thinking about this. Um, but it's, it's a team effort, right? When we say we're gonna uh, establish F, uh, an outcome or some, we're gonna collect metrics, I, I challenge my team to say, okay, well, how? How are you gonna do that? Um, without that, so if I, if I set out a project with my team and, and they say, we're gonna go hunting and we're gonna find evil, um, and they don't challenge me on this and we don't set out like what we're actually gonna do, um, I'd go with the last thing that I remember, right? Well, threat hunting is gonna find evil. That's, that's the most eye-catching thing. So this is the target, right? And if you don't catch evil, you're not really doing what you said you were gonna do. But we knew that hunting is more than just catching evil. Right? There's, there's value in all of that stupid stuff that we found. Um, so we have to proactively um, make our target bigger. Right? Uh, we have to plan for and collect those other metrics that are not just APT. Okay. Um, so yeah, to Justin's previous slide, can I blame management as a practitioner? Oh, hell yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I need to do here um, again, if we're going to turn Justin loose with his process and sweet pivot tables or whatever he has, um, we have to level set. So, uh, again, this is not going to be like an in the weeds sort of, this is how you hunt. That's, that's not what this is. Um, we're just trying to, I'm trying to set the stage so we have some shared terminology that we can use to try and effectively communicate um, what we're going for with the process here. So the 10,000 foot view of what I'm gonna talk about here for a couple minutes um, are the three phases. I'm gonna talk about hunting hypothesis, and very simply, that's where we're gonna define the question. I'm gonna talk about hunting activity. That's the fun part. That's where we're out trying to find stuff. And finally, we're gonna talk about the outcome. Um, and the outcome is uh, often overlooked, because like Justin said, we're not just looking for evil, we're looking for stupid. Um, it all has value, and, and that's, uh, those are things we hope to, to find in that outcome. Okay, so for hunting hypothesis, um, there's a really great quote that I'll start with. Uh, this is where the bulk of the work in this development is gonna happen, okay? It's at the front end in the hunting hypothesis. And the, the quote that I'll use is from um, Abraham Lincoln. And I know some of you have certainly heard this before. Um, I don't want to butcher this. It goes something like this. It's like, if you give me six hours to chop a tree, I'll use the first four to sharpen my ax, okay? And that really applies to this phase of the hunt. So um, when I say three plus days, we're talking about, say we're gonna dedicate a week to a specific hunt. The bulk of that time is gonna be in this phase of it. It's going to be in developing this hunting hypothesis. Uh, the way we develop that is we start with the miter attack framework. Um, and what's great about that is that we have our TTPs laid out here. We have our tactics, uh, blue across the top there in this matrix. Uh, so those are gonna be things like credential access, discovery, uh, initial access, things like that. Techniques, those are going to be in the columns underneath the tactics. So initial access is the technique there in the top left. 
uh, is the tactic in the top left, and the techniques are what's underneath it. Um, we're going to zoom in here on the technique of drive-by compromise, because that's going to have specific procedures that apply to that. Um, in this case, we've got things like a legitimate website is compromised, where uh, adversaries have injected some form of malicious code, um, might be some sort of malicious ad network, different things like that. Those are different questions that we can kind of answer that we can tie to our hunting hypothesis. This is what's going to drive that process for us. Uh, Spectre Ops is a company that we partner with quite a bit, um, and what we've essentially done here is, is stolen some of their work. <laughs> Um, because it's easy and because it's simple and explains what, what we do. Uh, so they have a five-step process for developing this hunting hypothesis. Uh, we just talked about sort of tactic, technique, and procedure. That was the previous slide. But the next part of that developing the hypothesis is being able to collect requirements. So that means sitting down and thinking about, okay, if I want to answer a question like, uh, say my hypothesis is something like, I believe that an intruder is using RDP to move laterally in my network, okay? That might be a, a hypothesis. It's something that we can test. So we, we can get that from the, the TTPs, but now we need to collect requirements to be able to sort of answer that question. So what are we gonna need? Well, maybe we can use some bro-con logs to try and answer that. Maybe we have bro-RDP logs. Um, but we wanna sit down, it's sort of like a brainstorm session. What is available to me? that can prove or disprove my hypothesis. Uh, next thing we have to examine is the scope, right? We need to sort of set some boundaries and limitations around what we're doing. So scope might be, I wanna look back the last week, the last month, the last year. Um, we have to set some parameters. Maybe we only care about a certain set of subnets, right? Um, but it's important to document all this. Excluded factors, what that's gonna be, um, if we go back to my RDP example, that's gonna be something like, okay, maybe, um, it would be super useful to have Windows security logs for that. But they're too hard to get in this case, or I don't have time this week to get it, or whatever the case might be. But it's important to document that that was something we didn't include here because it could be the seed of another hunt later. So that's the first phase. The second phase is the, uh, the hunting activity. Hunting activity is where the, the rubber meets the road. Uh, it's where we're actually executing the, the, the searches. This can be done in a day or two. Um, I had a professor once in college that used to say, any great question leads to further questions. Um, and that's kind of what I think of here, because uh, as you learn more about what you're looking for, uh, you know, it may well inform your original hypothesis. You might make new hypotheses from that. Um, so, and that all happens in the, the activity phase. And there's really three kind of buckets that, that this can go into. Uh, there's gonna be Potentially malicious activity found, although in my experience, that's usually the least common thing to happen in a hunt. Uh, there may be non-malicious activity found, right? We're gonna identify logging gaps. We're gonna identify vulnerabilities. Um, we're gonna identify stupid. Um, and then finally, we might just find nothing, and that's okay, because it's still telling us something. And the third phase of, of the hunting, um, that I wanna talk about here is, is the outcome. And the outcome, this is, I think, the most overlooked, uh, least often done phase, but honestly, it's probably the most important because you can do it in less than a couple hours, but just document, right? Was an incident created from that hunt that we just developed? Um, like I said, were there new detections uh, that were able to be created or new analytics? Um, was there any sort of vulnerability identified, any logging gaps identified? Um, any stupid people? I mean, <laughs> all important things. Um, so I'm curious, uh, how many people track outcomes uh, in their hunt programs? Anybody have kind of like very defined ones? So one thing that we found is, is people that did track outcomes weren't uh, tying them back in a, in, a, in a good way to the organization, right? Uh, if I'm the CISO, uh, you know, a lot of CISOs love to use frameworks. How are we doing? Uh, how are we improving these five areas in this CSF, or, or where does this fall in the top 20? Um, and so what we tried to do was, if you're gonna do, find an outcome, right, tie that back to whatever your framework is that you use. Uh, it, it, it added a whole lot of value to the customers that we were showing this uh, previously. So 
I'll go into the solution, or kind of at least our approach to the solution. So um, we're going to uh, define our processes using Confluence and Jira. Confluence and Jira is just what we had. We're not, we don't, not uh, employed by Atlassian or anything. Um, we're going to use industry standard frameworks like MITRE ATT&CK to develop our hypothesis. And uh, we'll focus on the CIS top 20 to uh, organize our outcomes. We're going to provide business relevant metrics from this. We're going to uh, show kind of like numbers of logging gaps, numbers of detections created, numbers of active hunts uh, in progress, and then maybe any incidents that have rolled out of this. And if that doesn't work, yeah, we got charts and graphs, and uh, hopefully that'll just make them stop asking questions. Um, so, uh, so Jira, um, for those, I, I believe most people are familiar with Jira. Um, Jira is used to plan, track, and report on projects. And then Confluence is a, like a basic knowledge base. Um, it, the reason why we chose both of those is it's, it's $20 for up to 10 users. You can deploy this, like you, there's Jira Cloud and Jira Server. Uh, they're pretty, pretty um, cheap. They're pretty powerful. They can be, admittedly, extremely frustrating. Uh, but we developed a config that uh, hopefully you can just kind of stand up and deploy. Uh, so how we're going to use that, we're going to track hunts in JIRA. We're going to track all the hypothesis, activities, and outcomes. And then we're going to automate reports uh, in Confluence. And these are all native. There's nothing super fancy we're doing in either of these tools. Uh, so a little bit of baselining. Uh, for standard issued uh, JIRA types, um, there's an epic. And then you have multiple things that will fall under that epic, like a, a task. And then you could have subtasks that go uh, a task. Um, for an example of this is like I'm going to bake a cake, right? And I, I need to prep ingredients, and then I need to mix ingredients. Under prep ingredients, I might break down that further and say I need to buy them and then measure and sort. So for ours, uh, we, we, do, we wanted to focus on the MITRE attack tactics. So there's, I'm going to ask you this question. I can't remember how many there are across the side. I should know that before I started the slide. But, but anyway, so there's, there, those are all pre-filled in the config that we have. Uh, and then you can generate hunting hypothesis, activities, and outcomes, and they'll all tie back to the original epic. Uh, so the standard JIRA issue states are to do, in progress, and done. Pretty basic for anybody who's used a Kanban board, right? And you move those through as, as you're going. We'll see if, I, uh, if we don't screw this up by the end of this. So our issue states, this is really important because each, uh, each type has its own issue state. So for a hunting hypothesis, you have planned. Oh, excuse me, I need to drink some water. So planned, um, like we know we want to hunt for RDP lateral movement, right? That, that's an idea that's not a hypothesis, right? Um, <clears throat> when you're developing the, the actual scope of that, uh, that, that's when you'll move it to the development phase. When it's ready to kick off activities, then you move it to the production side. Can anybody think of why you would retire a hunt? What? <laughs> Do you want one? I, All right. I'd say that that's a really good. Any? I would agree with that. Uh, any other ideas why you would retire it? No longer. What about the, go ahead. Yeah, so th what we were thinking is you could retire it if you promote it into an analytic or detection, right? You prove it out so tightly that now you can flip it over back to your sock as a detection. Right, so then you'd retire it because you're no longer using it to conduct hunting activities. Um, hunting activities, so we have our standard to-do in progress, and then we have our three outcome, outcome types, right? So malicious activity found, non-malicious activity found, nothing found. And then hunting outcomes, just because you find something doesn't mean it's done, right? Like, we found a whole bunch of missing logs, uh, but now we got to pester IT to make sure we get those logs. So we wanted to track the progress of those. And if you use like ServiceNow or, or Jira, maybe your IT team uses Jira, you tag them in that outcome and then track that to completion as well. So all together now, this is a really complex slide. I'll, I'll go ahead and admit this. So at the top, if, for an example, we have lateral movement as an epic. We have an idea. We're going to look for a remote desktop protocol in lateral movement. That's it. 
So we start developing this, right? Uh, we're going to use uh, these procedures. Here's our collection requirements. Here's our scope. We're ready to actually do it. It's ready for production. So we're going to move it to production. And in the config itself, you can't actually uh, conduct hunting activity unless you tie it back to a production level hypothesis. If this is a, a, a confusing, we'll share the slides. And it's all documented on the confluence itself. So then I can kick off a hunting activity. And it's tied back. You can link issues in JIRA. So we're tying that back to the original hypothesis. Uh, and this is pretty basic. It just says, OK, Justin did this on, on October 20th. And then I found some stupid stuff, right? Uh, I found that we're not logging RDP connections for our second domain. That's, that's a problem. And then I found Bob using domain admin creds for RDP logins. So I'm going to go yell at Bob. But this is the process kind of from end to end, right? And all of these are linked through, through how we've constructed it in JIRA. <laughs> Thanks, Captain Process. Uh, <laughs> so as we look at the JIRA, um, uh, go back to the three phases of the hunt that I talked about. Hypothesis, th this is the data that's going to be available to us there that we also need to populate. So uh, detailed view here. We're going to have uh, the title is going to be the MITRE technique that we talked about. We're going to have uh, the ongoing status that's tracked here. We're going to have the MITRE tactic label. As Justin uh, mentioned, this is going to link back to the epic, which becomes super important to this guy later. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> no, I care a lot, Justin. <laughs> you want to keep hunting? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and so this part of the hypothesis is really important because this is where we're really documenting um, that, that part that took all of the time. Okay, so we're going to have uh, the hypothesis, we're going to have the techniques that we're looking for here. Uh, so this could literally be like the specific hunts that, that you're going to execute uh, to try and prove or disprove your, your hypothesis. Uh, and the collection requirements, scope, and then uh, the excluded factors. Activity, the second phase of that, uh, that we talked about. Again, this is just the detailed view of what we're going to have there. Generic title, I don't know why Justin would be in this, because he doesn't hunt. He just makes processes. I can dream. <laughs> uh, we're going to have the status again to track that. MITRE tactic label, link back to the epic. Justin's getting excited now. Uh, <laughs> and working notes. And what this can be is, uh, it's not necessarily like a running diary, per se. It might just be something that we noticed uh, that might be relevant. It might be relevant to a hunt in the future, uh, but we're going to plug it in here. It's going to be a way to store that. And then finally, our, our outcomes. And we just have outcome one here. Um, there can certainly be more than one outcome in a hunt, um, but this is just to show you what we have. So we're going to have a descriptive title. In this case, boy, that's hard to read. Don't, no logging for RDP logs. Yeah, that's right. RDP event logs missing from our second domain. We're going to have the status as well, another link to the epic, the MITRE tactic label, what kind of outcome type is it, and again, our working notes that we talked about. This. Hold on one second. You got a question? <laughs> Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, it, so that's done. Here, I'll back up. So that's actually done. Actually, it didn't highlight it. Uh, oh, I didn't highlight it. Oh, bummer. I so that was a see, see right, right above this red box, there's a, uh, I'm not sure if you can read it, but trust me, the critical security control is listed there, right? Um, 600 lines, that's going to be a lot. There's only 20 here, which that was kind of playing in my favor. Um, 
but you could certainly pump in as many, you know, that's where you would link it. Mm -hmm. You good? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And this is where Justin's precious MBA heart starts to flutter. Because <laughs> all of this magic is just linked together. Um, and he can look at it all in one place and feel really good about what he did. Yeah. Yeah? All right. So uh, let's get to the reports. Um, so this is where we kind of, do all that linking that you saw on JIRA, this is why we were doing that, right, is the reports. So we, we did some example reports. We just have a general report on outcomes. We have the CIS top 20. It's very simplistic. Uh, the MITRE attack, where our coverage is, I'll show you all these. And then general user statistics. You could easily, one thing we didn't do, uh, that was another option we ran out of time, was uh, a tool-specific report, right? Which tools are aiding in my hunting, right? You could tag tools very easily in this. And, and again, these are all automatic. And, and these are out-of-the-box reports generated by Confluence. That's why you're going to see a lot of pie charts. I didn't want to make this overly complex. And then you guys have a lot of uh, development work that you have to um, pull back out of it. So outcomes report, what are we finding? Um, who specifically is finding it? Uh, are they reporting accurately? So we think that nothing found should only be about 20% of, of uh, hunt uh, end states, right? So do I have a hunter that is not reporting outcomes accurately? Or are they, are they thinking evil when they should be thinking stupid? Um, are our outcomes being actioned, right? Below here, uh, you can see outcomes and progress. So am I just finding a bunch of stuff and then it sits with IT forever? So CIS top 20, um, this is where I would show kind of, you know, if I, in this fictitious world that I'm managing a threat hunting team, um, if, if I'm reporting back to the CISO, how does this uh, up level of us and our trusted used framework, uh, I'm going to report any large gap areas. Uh, do we have gaps in the basics? Are we, are we focusing on some deployments maybe in the organizational controls that maybe we need to reprioritize and step back up uh, into the basics? On the attack report, um, where is my hunt team focused and where should they be focused, right? Uh, is the lack of focus on uh, data exfil uh, just because we have really good coverage there on existing tools and we don't need a hunt there? And then finally, general user statistics. What's going on right now? Um, what is stalled and where can I help? So one of the things that we said earlier was uh, hunting activity should be about one or two days, right? You do a lot of the work in the hunt hypothesis and then you execute that pretty quickly. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if, if, if an activity is lasting for more than one or two days and there's no, active, uh, no updates on the ticket, it'll report it here. And, and basically, I'm looking for where can I help, right? Where can I uh, reach out and see who got stalled in their work and do they need some help? And then who's the most productive, right? Just kidding. Yeah, don't do that. That's, <laughs> that's going to kill this right away, right? Uh, you, you definitely, this is supposed to be useful for your team. Uh, and what you don't want a, a walk a really fine line here. You want to make this useful for management, right? You want to report back what you're doing and how you're uh, adding value to the organization. But you don't want to artificially float a bunch of tickets, right? That's just going to kill this and uh, you're going to um, generate additional scrutiny. So um, general notes, again, we were using native Confluence. We're going to host the configuration uh, soon, if you want it, before we host it on uh, GitHub, just email us directly and we'll send it to you. <laughs> um, so there's a, tol there's a ton of automations and customizations you can get for JIRA. They're really easy, out of the box, kind of, um, you just enable them in JIRA and they could make this amazingly easy for you. I did not go that route because then you'd have to unwind a lot of the work. Um, it's better to use this as like a, a starting framework and then develop what you guys want to do uh, going forward and, and you know, autom automate from there. So, uh, and you can too. So one of the first things I, I got when I first showed somebody this is, God, this seems like a lot of work. My team's not going to do this. Tough, right? Um, you're asking uh, this, the, the organization to just give you air cover for the most highly skilled personnel in your environment and then not going to show them anything on the outside, that's, that's going to end badly. We actually saw that a, a, a bunch of times, right? You know, again, what are you doing for our organization? Um, also, this is extremely valuable to kind of, uh, I want to say, democratize the knowledge across your team, right? Um, how many times have you seen this where you get into an incident 
and uh, why don't we have DHCP records for, for, this, for this host? And then some guy uh, says, oh yeah, I found that like three months ago. Great, why don't you, why don't you, you know, report that? Well, it wasn't an incident. Um, this is a great way to like, uh, identify those things and then um, report them across the team. And if you think that we're just overcomplicating this, I really want to know that. Um, we scoured, when people were asking us the question, like how do you actually report and track these, uh, we could not find an example. Um, I think the, the most, the closest thing that we could find was actually the, the end game uh, book that came in the giveaway bags. Uh, and on page 17, there's a, a little paragraph on um, metrics and, and the importance of doing this, but there's no actual uh, how you would do it specifically. And if you want to start simpler, we're gonna also give you a, like a Word document, an Excel document. I'm gonna go ahead and say, don't use this. Like if you don't wanna work through JIRA and you just have nightmares about JIRA, there's a lot of people that are really religiously against JIRA. Um, this might be an easier way to start. It's just basically broken out by tabs. Um, allows you to kind of visualize and then maybe you just develop this in your internal process workflow tool. Yeah, so closing thoughts here. Um, this is really important to us, but the specific tool is not important, planning is. A common thing you hear is if you fail to plan, plan to fail. Um, that's pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, but it's really not important as far as in terms of what tool, but what is important is that you are doing it. You have to track it some way if you really want these outcomes to resonate and, and to get value out of your hunting. Um, because threat hunting is incredibly valuable not just for the finding APT or evil, but for finding stupid and correcting that. Um, don't let your hunt program get derailed, right? You get funding to, to set up this hunt program. At the end of the day, you have to answer to someone and someone wants to uh, know what they're getting for their investment. The higher level Justins <laughs> of the world, they scare me. Um, this is a good way to, to keep them away. <laughs> uh, and finally, that's where you can find uh, our slides. I've posted those out there. Uh, and I'm, where are we gonna put the config? Same place. Same, Same place. place, okay. Yeah. So the config will be there uh, relatively soon. Yeah. Any questions? questions? Oh. Do we do we have any tactics that we could so um, yeah, uh, are you saying I found this thing and, and nobody's um, actioning it because I can't, I can't convince them that it's a big problem, kind of? Am I getting the question right? So that's where I would use the framework, right? Uh, that's the value of tying it back to whatever framework you have, because then you kind of use management's words against them in that case, right? Like, uh, if you're gonna say that we're gonna identify to the NIST CSF, well, this thing that I found is hampering that, right? Um, that, that helped a lot of the people that we were talking to about this. And I guess I would also add that all stupid is not created equal, yeah. right? So there's stupid and then there's stupid. Um, I worked at a large corporation one time where we discovered we had 3389 open on the internet. That's stupid. <laughs> also really common. <laughs> yeah. So the question was, if you're gonna start a threat hunting program, uh, do you use NIST CSF like as a baseline, right? Um, <clears throat> I only see the value in NIST CSF in the top 20 to make it valuable for the people that I'm reporting to. Not necessarily something that, I, like I know that a login gap is a problem, but I need to communicate why that is a problem and I'm gonna use our organizational framework to like use the same language. So I, if, it's, if it's something that your organization does, then yes. Go ahead. Uh, the, the process that you put up. Um, you know, Did you ask the question? Who has the question over here? Right. Yep.
Yes. <coughs> So, oh, I see what you're saying. So, uh, How do you do that? Absolutely. So the, the hunt hypothesis, um, that means there's a, a production level thing that we can actually go do repeatedly, right? Uh, I might want to wait two weeks, a month to let the data build, right? So that it's useful to go back and search through that. But hopefully I've done 90% of the work so that all I do is, hey, and that's a really good way to, to put a junior person on that, right? Um, have your junior uh, person execute a predefined thing and then have like a senior person kind of double check their work. But meanwhile, the senior person is, is crafting the next hypothesis. So if it hasn't been moved. Yeah, I mean, it, you wouldn't want it just to be used like ad hoc, right? You'd want to schedule it. Um, it like you can auto schedule activities in JIRA. So you could say, um, generate a to-do hunting activity in two weeks for this production level uh, hypothesis. I know this is getting kind of in the weeds, but you can do this. You can say, like, we need to wait two weeks for the data build up, and we'll generate a, a, a to-do action. We'll assign it to the available hunter, and then they'll just go do it, right? But you should always, like, you, it, this builds on top of it, and you would never just forget about this original hypothesis unless you turned it into an analytic. So the, the hypothesis and the formation of the, sorry, I'm dying. I need more water, but um, yeah. you want to take that? Uh, so in my experience, um, what I think has been successful is um, I hate to like <coughs> pigeonhole people into like if, if you have SOC analysts being like, you know, this is what you do. You're looking at alerts all day long. Um, I think if you have a structured process, it helps with uh, developing junior analysts. So you know, if you go through some sort of rotation where like you're spending some time in the sock and then, you know, now you've got time to hunt. Um, I think it's a good way to build your team. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. There's, so you could add that to the workflow very easily. Um, yeah. You could say, like, needs approval, that kind of thing, yeah. Go ahead. Yep, so that, that's a really good question. It's iterative, right? Um, like you're, you're developing the hypothesis. You actually might find more outcomes developing the hypothesis than you would actually doing the activity, right? Because you're, well, we got to collect RDP logs, right? We don't have those. Uh, we need to you know, log that, right? So you will find a lot um, uh, in just constructing the hypothesis itself. Yes. 
we might have to talk more. Um, I, I, I want to kind of clarify your question a little bit, but. Kind of. I, I, we could probably, I, I can go into detail about this. Um, <clears throat> you just tired a hypothesis, right? You've created an alert. You just n note that you've, you're retiring the hypothesis and it re alert, uh, relates to this alert now that's in, in our sim, in our, you know. Um, go ahead. Right, exactly, and that's something that we track, right? There's um, one of the five example out, like um, end states of a of a hunting activity or outcome. One was detection created. That's ob honestly that's what you want, right? Hopefully, you don't find terrible and you kick off an incident. Although you know you will, um, but hopefully you're you're feeding your sock, right? A really good hunting program is feeding the sock. <coughs> yes. So I have an, an, uh, an answer, but I'd, I'd ask you to challenge me on this. Uh, sure. So for me, <coughs> I mean, it's done when it's done, right? So like times that we put in up here, it, it's super vague in general. It's like, here's a week. This is kind of how we'd split it up. I think it's better to think of that as more of a um, percentage. So like hypothesis, I think you're typically going to spend 60% of your time on. Um, the actual hunt. You know, it's going to be somewhere around 20, 25 percent. That that's just typical, um, and go from there. But it's it, it's hard to say. Like you have to get really you have to get really specific on your scope, right? <clears throat> because the problem is you don't know what you don't know. You're you're going to find things um, that are going to have more questions and and you know the whole iteration problem. So I guess my question is more about like say you don't find anything after two days. Mm -hmm. right? So I would say here that it's, it's really not so much about the, the time in that case. It's making sure that you develop a good hypothesis that allows you to feel good about the answer or conclusion that you get to. So you know, like once you've executed that search, you're like, okay, this is going to tell me what I need. So either I found it or I didn't, but like your hypothesis is complete enough so that when you do that, you feel comfortable saying, we're done here. I, I wouldn't say that you would go into a hunting activity without knowing how long it would take that makes any sense. Like you have done the scoping and the hypothesis so that you know that this would take about a day or two, if that makes any sense. It'd be really rare that you're like, whoa, we have just like tons of RDP logs or just all these random logs that I now had to have to piece together. That work's done in the hypothesis. Yeah. How, how far back do your logs go? <laughs> yeah, it's a balance, but if I haven't searched something before, I want to search it. But like, you know, to your point, maybe you don't have the time to go back two years. If you've got logs going back two years, though, good for you. And I, I'd search it if I have the time. Yeah, you have to identify the bucket of activity that you're going to do it in first, right? So I'm going to fit all this work into two days. So what is reasonable? 
right? What can I do in a reasonable amount of time? And that's dependent on, you know, the organization's logs. Right, yeah. And that's why the documentation of this whole process is so important because yeah. you can go to this and say, okay, uh, Jeff conducted this hunt on this date and this was the, his scope. So you can rule that in or out of this new hunt that you're conducting, right? So this is why documenting this is crucial. Yes, sir. Okay, so there's uh, a lot of parts to that question. Um, so the first thing is, uh, like for me, as someone that's sort of trained in incident response, it's all about priorities. Um, so if I'm on a hunt, right, and I find like active C2 activity coming from APT, whatever, that's my priority now. Okay, I have an active intrusion um, that needs to be dealt with. So that's where my, my resources and time are gonna go. Um, when you get into, okay, you, you identify this um, and you're saying you don't have the capability to sort of respond to that threat, <clears throat> call Mandiant? I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, would, I would honestly say that if, if, you're, if you don't have a really strong incident response process that, it, that is really well defined and you know what your action is, then you're not ready to do this, honestly. Um, it, you need to have that, those kind of foundations to, to do something like this. Threat hunting is, is tossed around, right, and it's a new hotness, um, but it, it takes a lot of work, uh, and it, it takes a lot of really advanced personnel. Right, and uh, just to add on here, the, the thing is, is that I think there's a lot of, uh, for people that don't have a lot of experience in this, there's a lot of fear about, uh, you know, the boogeyman, the APT, and how serious it is and all that, but like, your incident response processes and procedures, they're going to be the same, right? So it's like, um, detect, contain, respond. Like, uh, on some w way, shape, or form, that, that's how you're going to respond to threats on your network. So it's like, um, I'd recommend hiring people that, that you trust to be able to, uh, uh, you know, carry those activities out. Um, like I said, if you can't, then, then maybe you need to, to, to find outside help. But like, ultimately, it doesn't matter really if it's commodity or if it's APT, you have to have some sort of process and procedure in place to respond to, to things like this. And we're throwing around APT a lot. It's, I mean, what we're really finding right is like malware that's, that's not being caught by traditional tools. want a rabbit hole to just find, try to figure out how many like DNS servers you have, right? I mean, yeah. Any other questions? Sweet. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.